This is a spreadsheet that can recognize certain letters. The 16 by 16 grid of pixels is being analyzed and the sheet determines that it's showing a T. If we copy a different letter in there, the sheet recognizes it as an X. The same happens for an L. It's a pretty cool demonstration of machine learning, right? The spreadsheet implements a convolutional neural network, a specific type of neural networks that is helpful for image recognition tasks. This series walks through how to build such a network in a spreadsheet using only the built-in functions. In part one, we'll focus on what a convolutional layer is and how it can help us distinguish an X from a T. In part two, we'll expand upon the network to investigate how the deeper layer builds on earlier layers to recognize more letters. To get the most out of this series, you should have a decent grasp on basic neural networks. I've linked some resources below if you need a refresher. First, let's talk at a high level what makes convolutional neural networks better. Imagine you are staffing a restaurant and hire six people. If you ran your restaurant like a traditional fully connected neural network, you would just tell the six recruits, if you see a job that needs doing, just take care of it. Your staff roam around the restaurant. If they see a table with people, they might take their order. If they see a dirty table or bathroom, they clean it. As they wander into the kitchen, they might stir a pot left on the stove or cut up vegetables that someone else has cleaned. This sounds pretty hectic. Your restaurant might work okay, but each employee would be pretty overwhelmed trying to keep up with everything. In contrast, if you ran your restaurant like a convolutional neural network, you would assign employees to certain areas of the restaurant. You might assign two people to focus on the tables with people, one person to focus on the dirty areas, and three people in the kitchen. This organization would be much better. Each employee can focus and specialize in a certain area. By focusing on their tasks, your employees would work more efficiently and the restaurant would benefit. Let's look at that analogy a little deeper. In a traditional fully connected neural network, each node in the hidden layer is connected to every other node in the previous layer. Suppose we wanted to have a traditional neural network process an image. Remember that an image is a grid of pixels, which are really just numbers. 255 is white, 0 is black, and a gradient of gray for values in between. The first neuron in the hidden layer would need to be connected to every single pixel in that image. For a 16 by 16 image, this is 256 weights and a bias. Intuitively, we can see how that neuron might get overwhelmed having to learn 257 things at once. For a convolutional neural network, we'll have our hidden layer neurons focus on just a small part of the image. For example, this neuron looks at the upper left three by three pixels. We'll need more neurons in this hidden layer to cover the whole image, but each neuron will be less overwhelmed. This would still be a lot of weights in the network, so we make some of the neurons share weights, basically make them read the same employee handbook. These shared weights, or employee handbook, are officially known as a convolutional kernel, and we'll dive into that shortly. We are just about to dive into our spreadsheet, but first a roadmap of what we'll be building. Our input will be a 16 by 16 image. Next is a convolutional layer that will detect horizontal, vertical, and diagonal lines. Then is a max pooling and activation layer that focuses and simplifies those lines. Finally, our fully connected layer will count the lines detected and decide if it's an X or a T based on if they're more diagonal or not diagonal lines. In part two, we'll add one more set of layers to help us distinguish a T from an L. First up, let's see how a convolutional operation can help us detect lines. If you wanna follow along, here is a link to the template sheet. Make a copy, and let's start in the sheet called Exploring Convolutions. In the context of image recognition, a convolution is an operation that takes an input image and a small matrix and outputs an image. For each pixel of the output, we will look at the corresponding input pixel and its neighbors. Then we multiply those numbers by our kernel matrix and add them up. This is officially called a dot product, and in sheets, the function that does that is sum product. The first parameter is the upper left corner of the input image, the second parameter is the kernel matrix. We'll use F4 on the second parameter to use absolute references. That way when we drag the cells, this will keep the kernel fixed, but let the first parameter move across our input image. This first kernel is the identity. It takes 100% of the original input pixel and none from its neighbors. As a result, the output image is the same as the input image, just with the border trimmed off. That's not a particularly useful kernel, so let's check out a blur kernel. This will take 20% of our original pixel and to add on 20% of each of the adjacent pixels. Applying that kernel, we see the output image gets a bit blurry. If we want a smoother blur, we can try this one, which uses 20% of the original pixel and 10% of each of the eight neighbor pixels. 
Our goal is to find some kernels to identify horizontal, vertical, and diagonal lines from our image. Let's try this edge detection kernel from Wikipedia. It multiplies the input pixel by 4, and then subtracts off each of the adjacent pixels. Hmm, as an image, that output is not super clear, so let's change from an output image to output neurons. In a convolutional neural network, the math is the exact same, we just treat the output as a bunch of neurons instead of pixels. And to understand these neurons better, let's change the conditional formatting. We'll have 0 be white, or no activation, and 255 be intense red, or very activated. There. That's a bit easier to see that our neurons on the edge of the T are very excited. That's why this kernel is labeled as edge detection. Let's design a kernel for detecting vertical lines. Looking at an example pixel in the inputs, we see vertical happens when a given pixel is dark, and at least one of the horizontal pixels are white. Remember that white is 255, or high, and black is 0, or low. Let's put a 1 in the left and right slots of the kernel, so the neuron gets excited if those are white. Well, that's way too much excitement, so let's tell the neuron to calm down if it itself is white by putting a negative 2 in the center. That's pretty good, actually. We want to make sure we focus on stretches of vertical pixels, so let's copy that pattern to the top and bottom row. This works well here, but in our network I'm going to use a scaled-down version based on some experimentation. For a horizontal line kernel, we'll use the same kernel, just rotated 90 degrees. Wow, that looks pretty good. It activates on these horizontal areas. We know that we have diagonal lines up and to the left when we have white pixels in the bottom left and upper right corner. We don't want activation unless this cell is black and the pixels on the diagonal are black as well. Negative 0.5 is fine here. We notice the whole image is slightly activated now, and if we add up our kernel cells, that value is greater than zero. We should try to have our kernels be zero or slightly negative so this doesn't happen. Slightly penalizing the adjacent cells with negative 0.25 seems to have the desired result. The final diagonal kernel is a mirror of the other diagonal one. With these four kernels, we can have our convolutional neural network detect vertical and horizontal lines and diagonal lines in both directions. Let's go ahead and build the first layer, the convolutional layer. On layer 0, input sheet, I'm going to paste one of the sample images so we can see our work. Then, let's go to layer 1, convolution sheet. There's space here for four kernels, four different convolutions. We call these features when used in a convolutional neural network. I've gone ahead and copied the kernels from our exploratory sheet into the appropriate places. Just like we did in the exploratory sheet, we'll use the sum product function. The first parameter will be the upper left corner of the input image, and the second will be absolute references to the first feature matrix. Then, we can drag the cells to copy the formula for the entire image. Let's repeat the process for the next feature matrix. The first parameter starts again in the upper left corner of the input image, and the second parameter is an absolute reference to the second feature matrix. We can repeat this twice more for the remaining two features. We now have four sets of 14 squared neurons that are activated in the areas where there are vertical, horizontal, or diagonal lines. This is a lot of neurons to deal with, and some of our neurons have negative values. For example, in this empty space here. Negative values can be an issue later, and we also want to simplify our images a bit to make it easier for our later layers to work. That's where the max pooling layer comes in. The first goal of the max pooling layer is to downsample the neurons we have. The output of layer 1 is 14 by 14, and we want to shrink this down to 7 by 7. On the layer 2 sheet, I have space for this 7 by 7 grid. To compute what goes in the upper left corner, we simply take the maximum value of the upper left 4 pixels from feature 1. That's where the max in max pooling comes from. To remove negative numbers, we can add a zero parameter to max. This is known as the rectified linear unit activation function, or ReLU. For more on this activation function and others, check out the linked video in the description. Anyway, for the next cell, we want to do max pooling on these cells here. We don't want to overlap with the existing range, so we really can't just drag this cell. 
I'd rather not type almost 200 slightly different functions here. So I'm going to use the offset, row, and column functions to implement this sliding window. Instead of referencing the cells directly, I'm going to use offset and set the anchor point to be the top left of the first feature. We'll start with the offsets of 0 and use 2 for our width and height. This is equivalent to what we had before. Then I'm going to add in row minus 1 times 2 and column minus 1 times 2 which will move the target area over two columns and rows if we drag the function over one column or row. This template over here has the final formula if you need it. For our other three features, we will use the same formula, just with a different anchor point. The final layer in part 1 is a fully connected layer that will have two output nodes, one for t and one for x. If we weren't making this in a spreadsheet, we would need to connect the 49 neurons from each of our four features to each of our two output nodes. Forgive me, but I didn't draw the 400 lines on this diagram, and thankfully we won't be doing 400 multiplications in our spreadsheet. Instead of the 49 distinct weights per feature, we will simplify things by using one weight per feature. For example, we will basically add up how much diagonal line feature exists in the image, rather than caring precisely where those diagonal lines are. Let's add up how much vertical line feature our image has using the sum function. We can do the same for feature 2, 3, and 4. Now for the four weights in the bias. For the T node, we'll give a positive weight for the horizontal and vertical lines, and a negative weight for the diagonal lines. T's have horizontal and vertical lines, but no diagonal lines. For the X node, we'll do the opposite. The bias of each of these we'll leave at zero, just for simplicity. We have our weights, bias, and input values. Let's compute the weighted sum then for our two neurons. In a standard neural net, you might use an exponential to scale the value to be between 0 and 1. For classification, when you want the network to pick one result, the softmax function is used. Softmax is a normalized exponential function. We'll compute e to the power of the weighted sum, and since Sheets really doesn't like huge numbers, we're going to add a constraint with min. Then we'll add up all those exponential values and normalize each row by that sum. This works with x, but what about a t? Yes, it does. Try it out with the other sample data. It's not a perfect classifier, but it should be reasonably accurate. That's it, a convolutional neural network that we designed and built ourselves. Takeaway 1 should be a better understanding of how convolutions can find features like vertical, horizontal, and diagonal lines. Takeaway 2 should be an intuition for how we can combine those features to make decisions about what object we're seeing. In part 2, we'll explore adding a second layer to the spreadsheet convolutional neural network where we can make better decisions about shapes and differentiate T from L. I'll see you there.